Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Glad to see a uh, nearly full room. My name is Tim. I am one of the uh, tech leads on the Kubernetes project. Uh, my name is Mike Rubin. I'm a tech lead and manager in Kubernetes also. We are here today uh, to talk to you about networking in Kubernetes, specifically in Google Cloud. <clears throat> I hope that by the end of today, uh, you'll all realize that this is not nearly as scary or complicated uh, as it sounds, um, or maybe I'm wrong. So let's start. The, the point of Kubernetes is to run clusters, right? A cluster is natively a networked construct. It is fundamentally about machines that talk to each other. Because of that, we have to take networking really seriously from the very beginning. You, you can't think about, to, you can't comprehend Kubernetes and what we're doing without really understanding the network. It's really easy to get overwhelmed when we talk about Kubernetes. There's a lot of new terms. Everybody here is probably familiar with basic TCP IP networking, and we're going to build on that knowledge. But there's a lot of new concepts that we need to bring in, things like namespaces and virtual interfaces and forwarding and IP tables. We are going to demystify that today for you, uh, I hope. So we don't really have a lot of time to do a Kubernetes 101 today. Uh, so uh, if, you're, if you want to talk about how Kubernetes works and the basic constructs, I'm happy to talk to people afterwards, uh, or you can find us on GitHub, talk to me on email. Um, but I do want to run through a couple of background topics that we're going to touch on today during our talk, because I think it's important that everybody um, understand these basics when we talk about these words. So the first term uh, I'm going to introduce is our API server. Kubernetes is a very API-centric system. The API server is the center of our universe. Everything in our system talks to the API server. Our API is a REST API. The R in REST is for resource. So we tend to talk about our API concepts in terms of resources or objects. Uh, they, they mean the same thing. It's really just a serialized blob of data that we store on our server that represents a concept in our system. So API server is at the center of everything. The second concept I want to introduce is a pod. Hopefully, if you know Kubernetes, uh, you know what a pod is. It is a, uh, a very little tiny VM-like thing that runs your containers. It is a group of containers that we schedule together. It is the atom of Kubernetes. When the containers in a pod uh, start and stop, the pod still exists. When you delete the pod, all the containers go away together. The interesting part here is one of the fundamental pieces of a, of a pod is the network. Everything inside of a pod shares a network. They all see each other as local hosts. They are the same. IP address, right? This is really important. The next concept to introduce, controller. So a controller is fundamentally how Kubernetes is built. It is basically just a piece of code that runs in a loop that watches our API server and responds to changes, right? So for example, when you create a pod, you want to schedule something in our system, the scheduler wakes up. The scheduler is a controller. The scheduler makes a decision about where it's going to put the pod. It writes something back to the API server. The kubelet wakes up. The kubelet is a controller. These are a, a fundamental concept that we're going to build on uh, over and over throughout this talk. The main job of a controller is to, ma to make the reality match the intent. You declare what you want it to do, and we're going to make it happen. So a label. Our API is full of these resources, these objects. A label is a tiny little piece of metadata, string to string mapping key value, that you can attach to any one of our API servers. And you can attach any number of these things to, uh, to our API objects. Um, these are used for you to group things however you want to group them. We cannot possibly predict how people are going to want to use, to group, to slice and dice uh, our API. So we provided a really generic mechanism here. This is fundamentally the only grouping construct in Kubernetes. We're going to build on this when we talk about services and we talk about endpoints. Similar to labels is something called annotations. An annotation is the same structure, but unlike a label, which we tend to use for identification, uh, we tend to use an annotation for third-party pieces to carry extra information about an object. So the counterpart to labels <coughs> is selectors. A label declares what something is. A selector de declares how you're going to use the thing. Right? So if you're a SQL head, think of it as select pods where some condition. Uh, this gives us a really loose coupling between concepts in our system. Uh, it means that you, as a user, can manage groups however you want to uh, manage them, however you want to slice and dice them. Uh, for example, things that use selectors are services, deployments, uh, replica sets. <coughs> 
So a quick example of a selector. So imagine I've got my, my application here running. I've got, they're all part of my store, but I've got some front ends, and I've got some back ends, and I've got some production services, and I've got some test services. So I can select with a very simple selector all of my store pods that are a part of the front end, but I could also select all of my store pods that are part of my testing, right? So you can see here how I can select it any way I want. Now I could add another label, and I could add another dimension of selection, right? And you can do this arbitrarily however you need to do to manage your applications. So similarly, I could just select the whole thing. So let's talk about the IP per pod model. As Tim said earlier, that every pod is going to have its own IP address. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do networking in, with respect to containers. Um, Docker chooses to use, you know, you know, we don't choose to use a lot of complexity. We want to rely on Kubernetes on a lot of old concepts and traditional ideas involving routing and networking. There's no machine private IPs, no port mapping. Um, every pod has an IP address and it's accessible to all the other pods, just like every virtual machine or real machine has an IP address and it's easiest when it's accessible to all of the other and network entities that you've got in your, in your network. Um, we're going to be using in Kubernetes, we're going to show you how this works, Linux network namespaces and virtual interfaces in order to implement the schema. So here's a VM represented with a box. Most computer diagrams are boxes when you see another box. Um, the VM is going to have an Ethernet device, ETH0, and this is normally how you think of network traffic coming in and out of your machine. Now, in truth, there's this root namespace, network namespace, that we associate with the Ethernet device um, for Linux. And this has settings for TCP IP stack, perhaps other data structures associated with the Linux kernel that are the context and environment for your, your network environment on the virtual machine. What we want to do is have a pod with its own environment and give it the illusion that it's living inside its own space and that you know, it's on its own machine. So we create a network namespace for that pod. And it's the first pod, so we're going to label it the really imaginative name pod one. Now we have a virtual machine with two environments that you can run your application in, each one believing that they're inside their own network um, namespace. And the problem here is networks are useful when they can talk to each other. Right now, these can't. Here we can bring up the idea of a virtual Ethernet device. For Linux, it's really just uh, a pipe pair. Data will come in one side and come out the other. And we want these two namespaces to talk to each other. So we take the pipe pair, and using, again, some basic Linux tools, we can have the pipe pair span the namespaces. Inside the root namespace, we can give it any name we want, and we'll call it virtual Ethernet device XX. And inside the pod one, we give it E0, so it looks like it's inside its own virtual machine. We can do this as many times as we want. Here we have two pods on the same virtual machine, each one believing that they're running inside their own context, and um, they're talking to the root namespace. This is a step forward. But we really want them to talk to each other. So we introduce the um, concept of a bridge. And the bridge is, again, something that you've been using in networking for decades, uh, L2 level routing generally using the ARP protocol. I hope that most of you are familiar with this. It's pretty old standard stuff. You can Google it and find out lots of tools associated with it today. So let's take a look now at traffic moving from pod to pod inside the same node. Pod 1 wants to send a message to pod 2, so it has an IP packet. Source IP is pod 1, and it's going to pod 2. It leaves the pod 1's network namespace, goes through the pipe pair, hits the virtual Ethernet device, gets into the root namespace, then goes to the bridge, uses all the ARP logic and technology to find the right virtual Ethernet um, destination. And then, once it gets to the top of its pipe pair, goes right through the pipe pair and ends up in pod 2's namespace. It's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And using basic concepts that, if you're familiar with just rudimentary of networking, should feel familiar to you. So, Pods have to be reachable across VMs also, not just inside of one VM. Kubernetes itself doesn't care how you do this. You can use L2, L3, overlay, carrying pigeons, unicorns, it doesn't matter. But there has to be some standard way to do this stuff. Um, every VM is given an IP block, and every pod is given an IP address inside that block. So we, one thing we have to do for Google Container Engine is teach the network how to route packets in between VMs. 
So luckily, we have Tim here. He knows all about this stuff, and he's going to show us. So building on the image that we looked at before, these are the same sorts of machines, only now we've got two of them, and they're connected to our network. So as Michael mentioned, we have to teach the network uh, how to do this routing. So what happens when we send a packet out of pod one destined for pod four? Right? Same as before, it's going to leave the pod, it's going to enter the root namespace, we're going to hit the bridge. Now, the ARP is going to fail on that bridge. There's nobody on that bridge who's answering this IP address, so it's going to send it out the default route. The default route in this case is ETH0. So we send it out the default route, it leaves the VM, and it enters Google Cloud's network. And it promptly goes to nowhere. It goes nowhere because we have anti-spoofing protection built into Google Cloud, and the network knows that this VM has an IP address, and the source IP is not the right IP address. So we have to set up a couple of things before we can make any of this work. So the first thing we do when we create a VM, we, we tell GCP that these are all routers, right? And the routers have a flag called can IP forward, uh, which means that it's allowed to disable anti-spoof protection, but for only for this VM. The rest of the network is still spoof safe. Then we add a single static route per VM, which says, hey, if you see any packets bound for this IP range, send it over to this VM, and the VM will know what to do, right? The GCP network handles the rest. So let's go back here. We've got this packet. It's from pod one. It's going to pod four, right? This time it passes through the network successfully, and it's delivered to the second VM, and the packet flows in the exact same way that we looked at before. There's nothing special here. There's no translations required. There's no encapsulation. There's no overlays. It just flows the way a network should flow. So one other thing that's important to remember, we just talked about network namespace setup and virtual Ethernet device setup and all of these areas in gcloud to turn off spoofing. It's all automatically handled for you in Google Container Engine. You don't have to go to the man pages and learn all of these pieces. You just turn on the system, and by default, as you start um, creating pods and creating, um, you know, these things will just be set up. But let's get back to progressing through the network stack inside of Google Container Engine. Um, how do we deal with change? Your cluster is a living dynamic system. Sometimes you're going to want to scale it up as load increases, or you're going to want to scale it down possibly as um, you know, load decreases, or you know, maybe revenue becomes more of an interesting issue in your life. Um, rolling updates, you're going to want to turn off some pods and then turn them on again in, with new software. You're going to want the pods, maybe if they crash or hang, to be unscheduled and rescheduled somewhere else. Maybe the VM is rebooting. All of these events involve your pod getting a new IP address. And keeping track of all of these IP addresses, it's a lot of work. You know, you'll have to start keeping track of state. And anyone who's kept track of state knows that that's never fun. So you want to find a way to have your system's network traffic be able to find the pods that you care about without a lot of work on your behalf. And G Google Container Engine helps you with this. With services. Dun, dun, dun. Um, the service abstraction, it's an abstraction and another resource or object that lives inside the API, API server. It's basically a mapping of a, a cluster IP address or a virtual IP address to a group of endpoints, usually pods. It provides you a stable VIP, and the VIP, when you send traffic to it, will then route that traffic to the pods that are being selectively associated with that service. We're going to examine the default implementation of this in Google Container Engine. But like many things in Google Container Engine, you can always componentize it and try to do something else if that's really what you need. Um, the set of the pods behind a service can change dynamically, and it doesn't really matter. As long as you have that VIP, your traffic can reach those pods. So let's try to create a service. Here's the YAML. Um, the fields that really matter is the name. In this case, we're going to call it the store-be for maybe all the store backend pods. And the selector here says mm, the application that matches store and the roles that are the backend. So the selector field here is going to then find all of the pods that with these labels and associate them with this service. What you get back is some information from Kubernetes API server. It's going to automatically create a distributed load balancer for you. And it's also going to allocate this cluster IP 109376. And this is the IP address that within the cluster, any traffic to that IP address is going to make sure it reaches one of those pods and it's going to smear this traffic over randomly and fairly. The idea here is that it's balanced across all of those pods. Now, I'm going to take a slight digression, because this word is a very accurate word in this context, but it's overloaded in networking and sometimes in Kubernetes. The idea of what is an endpoints resource or object in the API server. 
Um, as we said earlier, every time you create a service, you're also having to select the pods that are associated with that service that the traffic is going to be routed to. And you have a selector associated with it. Well, when you create a service in Google Container Engine, you also have Google Container Engine for you create an endpoints resource or object with the same selector. So if you have a bunch of pods that you associate with that service, in this case, App Store role DE, well, they're going to be found by uh, the endpoints, uh, the Kubernetes system, which will associate them with the endpoints, and it's going to automatically create for you this endpoints object. And why do we need this? Well, it turns out that in Google Container Engine and in Kubernetes in general and open source also, a lot of objects and controllers really want to know about all of the pods associated with a service. And they make this query over and over and over again. And it's an expensive query. So as an implementation detail, we've decided in Google Container Engine to create a resource just for this mapping of service name to pod IP addresses. This way, as pods come and go, we have a convenient cache of the locations and IP addresses for all of these pods. The only thing that makes this kind of you know, coming in and out, in, out, much like a pod going up and down, um, only thing that makes this really interesting and sometimes confusing is it has the name endpoints, and we have HTTP endpoints, and we have a lot of other network terms that refer to endpoints. Um, that's the only reason we brought it up today. Uh, it confused me. It took me like two months to realize exactly what we were talking about when we started with the project. Uh, let's take a look now at the life of a packet from the pod to a service. Looks very familiar to what we've seen before. The packet leaves the pod. And uh, should I move, or is this good? OK. The packet leaves the pod. Source IP address is the pod. And what's different now is the destination IP address is going to the service, in this case, service 1. Goes from the network namespace through the pipe, hits the bridge. But instead of going to another um, pod, it's going to instead go to IP tables. In IP tables, we're going to do a DNAT. And the DNAT's going to take that destination service. And remember, a service is just a, a handle to a group of pods. It's going to take that service and pick the pod that we want this packet to go to, in this case, pod 99. And it's going to use a system called contract to remember which pod it sent this IP, uh, this connection of traffic to. What's contract? Contract is another Linux system that does connection tracking for you. It bases it on the five tuple of uh, IP header that you're sending the traffic out to. And it does a lot of other things too, but it's going to remember where it came from or where the initial destination was. We're going to see how it's being used for Kubernetes networking um, as we continue the talk. So now we have rewritten the destination IP address for pod 99, or IP tables has done the load balancing on this machine to take our traffic instead of to the service IP to the actual pod that the service is fronting for us. And then when that pod has responded, it comes back, coming from pod 99, saying, I want to go back to pod 1. It hits the IP tables. The IP tables uses contract to undnet. Uses contract to undnet the packet, rewrites the source IP header from pod 99 to service 1. And sorry, we have some audio stuff going on. Is this cool? OK, I'll continue. Um, and then it goes on its merry way, just like we've described a few times already, all the way back to the pod one's network namespace. So let's take a li bit, little more look at the IP tables. The IP table rules, if you look at them raw, are really, really scary. But this is some of the things you really have to remember when you look at services and IP tables. Um, the IP tables are really performing one piece of logic. They're trying to route that packet and the traffic in general to the pods behind the service. So they check to see if the destination IP and the port match the services in port. And if they do, they're going to pick one of the backends at random and then rewrite the destination and send that connection on its way to that appropriate pod. Now, here's something else that's kind of funny and a lot of people have asked about. All of this work is happening within the Linux kernel. We are not copying the data out of the kernel into user space playing with the packets, and then sending it back into user space again. It's really inefficient. It's really not the right way to do it. Um, but it is the way when we first began working on Kubernetes and Google Container Engine, it is how things used to work. And this is just sort of getting things off the ground and prototyping. Uh, 
So because of that, the system and that the, the pod that actually maintains all of these IP table rules is called the cube proxy, because it used to be a proxy for all this network traffic. It's not actually a proxy today. All it does is just talk into it. Can I sing and dance? <laughs> all right, great. I don't know. Can you? Uh, no, I can't sing, nor can I dance. Um, thank you, Tim. For <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, so, Cube Proxy. Cube Proxy is a, it's a pod that lives on every node and it maintains these IP table rules for you. It used to do this in user space, which is why it has a name that's very confusing, but now it just maintains the IP table rules that keep the services running. It's a controller, just like many of the other pieces of Kubernetes infrastructure, and it watches the API for services changes, and when they change, it's going to update the IP tables for you. Um, so let's go take a look at life of a packet from pod to service. Right now, the source is going to come to the service, and destination is coming to a pod. Destination is coming to the pod. Oh, wait, I'm hitting the wrong button. Yeah. Between the mic and the singing, it's way too much fun. Services, uh, DNS is just another service inside of Google Container Engine. Um, that's how we implemented it. You don't really want to hard code the name and IP, uh, you don't want to hard code the IP address of all of these services into your code. But if you know the name of the service, you may want to hard code the name of the service to direct your traffic to all of the pods associated with that service. So Google Container Engine will automatically, when you create that service, put the service's name inside the DNS space inside the Google Container Engine. Um, it uses normal A and SRV records, so you don't really have to do anything. And DNS itself runs as a pod and as a service for you, just using the same infrastructure that we're asking people to use. Uh, DNS service has got a little bit of extra magic and sugar. Uh, just like other services, things that we can show you, any service, and we use, use this for DNS, can request a particular cluster IP. So we know with DNS, we want to use the IP address 10.0.0.10. So we specify that when we create the service, and we know that we're going to get that IP address, or we'll get an error when we create the service. Also, something special about DNS is it's auto-scaled to the cluster size. It's actually a ratio of nodes versus cores, but the idea here is we don't really ever want DNS to be overloaded. Uh, Google Container Engine has a little bit more surprise and fun and adventure when we do that, so we auto-scale it to keep things running correctly. Um, again, just like other services, the VIP is stable. Services are simple and powerful. You can use any port you want. You don't have to worry about conflicts. You, you know, can request a particular cluster IP, as we just described, and you can remap ports. Um, that's all there really is to it. The big thing to remember, again, is services are an abstraction. They're an idea of mapping of a name and IP address to pods that lives and you can manage in the API server, but the implementation of it is kind of spread across all the IP tables and maintained by Cube Proxy inside of Google um, Container Engine. It doesn't really have one running process that's doing all of this work, but all you need to know as a customer and a client is you set up the service, you hit the client IP address, or you hit that DNS name, and that's really all you have to handle. Google Container Engine takes care of all this complexity for you. Um, let's talk about sending external traffic. What if you want to take traffic outside of your GCP project to the outside world? Egress. Um, VMs all get private IPs inside the uh, 10.0.0.8 IP range, and VMs can also get public IPs. When they get a public IP, they get one public IP mapped to one private IP. So let's look at the life of a packet from going from VM to the internet. Here we have a, our same happy virtual machine with the root namespace, eth0 device, inside a GCP project. We send a packet out with the VM internals IP address, the source going to 8888. And then in the NAT subsystem of the GCP project, we rewrite the internal address to the external so the external internet knows where this um, uh, packet came from and can route it back. And away we go. And then, because 8888 is maintained by this fabulously happy company, comes back really fast and we go back to the VM external address. Also, for those of you who are not in the audience, there's one person laughing at my jokes, which is really cool. <laughs> um, we rewrite the external IP address to the internal IP address. It's not really a big deal. It's normal routing, like always. But what happens with a pod? Everything's a little different. 
just like always, the pod comes from the root namespace, comes up through the device, hits the bridge, comes out through the VM, the source here, sorry, glanced over that, the source here is the pod IP address, hits the NAT, and eh, it's dropped. The one-to-one -one NAT inside the GCP for security only really understands and allows VM IPs to get out. The pod IP does not equal the VM IP, so it gets dropped. When in doubt, what's the answer? IP tables. And so here we masquerade again, or we use source NAT, and we apply this to any packet with a destination that's outside of the internal cluster's IP range. So let's take a quick look at that again. Life of a packet pod to internet, we go all the way up to the IP tables. We rewrite the pod one source to the VM internal IP address. It leaves the VM, it goes to the NAT subsystem. Now we rewrite it again from VM internal to external just as before, goes to 8888, comes right back. We rewrite the destination external to internal just as before, hits the ethernet device, goes into the IP tables, we use contract in the same system that we built all this logic on to now rewrite it with the pod one's IP address. And by now, I hope some of you are tired of this path as we go back to the pod one network namespace. Um, Tim? So that gives you a pretty good picture of how packets move around within your GCP cluster, right? And that was super cool, but it's not really that interesting because most of us have to deal with the outside world. And getting out to you know, GitHub is cool and all, but it's not gonna sell you product. You gotta take traffic in, right? This is a really complicated problem. Uh, for Kubernetes in general, uh, we have to build it to the particular platforms that you're running on. So Kubernetes on GCP is going to rely on a couple of different GCP products to bring traffic into the cluster, and we're gonna see how uh, we use those products. So in particular, we, for the Kubernetes API where we set a, a type load balancer, we're gonna use Google's network load balancer at L4. And where we use the ingress resource, we're going to use the L7 load balancer, the HTTP and HTTPS load balancer. So let's look at L4 first, because it's the uh, less exciting one. So we looked at service earlier, right? Michael mentioned cluster IPs. So we're going to change the type from a cluster IP to a load balancer. Now, the way we've set this up is these are sort of concentric. So a cluster IP node port load balancer. So load balancer still is a cluster IP. It's still gonna get allocated an IP address within my cluster, but what happens when I set this is another controller wakes up. This is our Google Cloud controller. It wakes up and it says, hey, I know what to do with that. I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna create a Google load balancer and I'm gonna set up all the routing and I'm gonna make it work for you. So when it's done with that, it's gonna write back to the service, you have a load balancer and its ingress point is this IP address. Right? So now you as an end user, you can take that IP address, you can stick it in your DNS, you can share it with your customers, you can write it on the bathroom wall. People will find your store. So let's, let's look at how this works like in practice. So we have a cluster here. And to make things fun, this cluster has three VMs. One VM happens to have one of my particular pod, one VM has none, and one VM has two. So now I create that service with type load balancer. This controller wakes up and it goes off and it creates a Google network load balancer. If anybody's really familiar with the Google Cloud API, this is a forwarding rule, right? It's gonna create a forwarding rule and it's going to point that forwarding rule at all of my VMs. And this means we don't ever have to update the forwarding rule except if the VMs change, because that's sort of a slow API. So we program it, we program it to all of these VMs. So now, user has found our store and they're gonna send us some traffic. The, the packet here is from the client to the load balancer. This is important. Now we go through this load balancer and the load balancer has to make a decision. It looks at all of the VMs that are eligible to be chosen. It's going to pick one of these three. In this case, we're gonna pick VM1. It doesn't really matter which one we choose because the same flow is gonna happen in all of them. So now we send the packet on it. Shoot, we have a firewall. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do automatically is we're gonna run gcloud firewalls create. We're gonna open up the firewall for you on that port so that the load balancer can now talk to your service. So now this packet comes through this firewall, or comes through the load balancer, and it enters your GCP network. And this is the coolest part. Google's network load balancer is not a proxy, it's a packet forwarder. 
So when this packet comes into your network, the destination address is still the load balancer, and the client, of the source address is still your original client. So you can examine that IP packet and figure out who sent you this traffic, right? That's pretty neat, and it's really important, and I'm going to mess it up in just a second. So this packet arrives at a VM, and we bring it into this VM. The, pa the, the uh, source and destinations are unchanged from before. Now, hold on a second. I said that it doesn't matter which VM you land on, right? But clearly, one of these VMs would be a bad choice, right? The load balancer, like all of the cloud load balancers as we go through this container revolution, they only know about VMs, right? VMs don't map one to one with pods. We have more, more pods than we do VMs, or we have less pods than we do VMs, or we have the same number, but they just don't happen to map correctly. We call this the, the imbalance problem, right? Imagine for a minute that I actually set it up so that it only sent traffic to these two VMs, and we ignored the one that has no backends, right? I'm going to send 50% of the traffic here. I'm going to send 50% of my traffic here. That seems completely reasonable from the load balancer's point of view, since it doesn't know that there's more VMs on one than on the other. So at the end, what you get is one pod that has 50% of your traffic and two pods that have 25% of your traffic. Whatever monitoring system you're going to use is going to go nuts. Right? It's not going to know what to do with this. It's not going to know how to scale your application, and your ops team is going to hate you. I mean, they probably already do, but <laughs> they'll hate you more. Um, so this is the general imbalance problem. So we set out with the initial design to not trigger the imbalance problem. So how do we avoid the imbalance? We squirt some IP tables onto it. Uh, IP tables is the, the caulk of uh, networking systems. You, you squirt it in wherever there's a gap to fill in and smooth things over. So this packet comes into this VM, and we're going to consider which pod am I going to send it to, right? This is the same path that we saw before, only now it's coming in from outside, and we have to consider all of the pods across all of the VMs, right? So in this case, we're going to choose pathologically, and we're going to pick a pod on a different VM, right? So I'm going to send this packet. First of all, first I'm going to do a destination NAT, which we saw before. This is literally the same set of IP tables rules. So don't think of these things as additive. They are really the same set of logic. I'm going to do my destination NAT. I'm going to send the packet out. Now note the, the address here has changed. Uh, the destination says pod 2. But the original is still the client, the, the source IP. And I'm going to forward this packet down. And it's going to land at the second VM. And just like before, it's going to arrive at this pod. We're going, to, we're going to respond. We're sending back from pod 2 to our client. And because it's from pod 2 to the client, it's going to go out to the internet. It actually will go through that NAT thing that Michael just talked about. But it's going to go out to the client, and it's going to get dropped. Why does it get dropped? Well, the client sent a packet to the load balancer. It didn't send a packet to this pod or this VM. And so this TCP session isn't going to complete, right? So let's rewind for a minute back to when that packet first arrived at the first VM. We have to do a second NAT, which is the source NAT. We have to change the source IP to be from this VM. I'm forcing the first VM to be in the traffic path in order to achieve my balancing. So now, when you see this packet fly across the network, the source is VM1 and the destination is pod2. All of that cool stuff about keeping the client IP address from the network load balancer, I just frittered away. But just wait. There's more. Um, so <laughs> there's more IP tables. Uh, the packet's going to arrive at the second VM the same way we saw before. It's going to be delivered to the pod. It's going to come back, no problem. Contract is going to wake up, realize that it has to unnat this packet twice, and then it's going to respond back up. The load balancer will return it, and it will merrily go on its way to your customer. Whew. That is a little complicated. So, that imbalance problem, it, it's, a, it's a real problem, uh, and we chose to avoid it, right? Now, the good news is that in practice, we're really well balanced. The bad news is you have that extra network hop, which can cause some extra network latency, uh, and it hides this client from the user's backend. It turns out, surprise, users want to make this choice for themselves. So... Dun, dun, dun. How do you deal with this? Network problem, only local. Um, not just IP tables, we're going to apply an annotation. What are the problems that we're trying to resolve here? Well, sometimes some of the customers, as Tim said, they would rather 
risk the imbalance or find a way to provision around the imbalance, and they really care about getting the client IP address, um, you know, it, it's a big deal. And also, they don't want to deal with the double hop and the latency issues. So in Google Containers Engine, we now support only local. You can apply the annotation only local onto the service, and we're going to go see how that works, too. Again, this is all being set up for you auto-magically. What only local does is it's going to make sure that when you make that routing selection, the uh, VM that you pick is the local one. So as Tim said earlier, the imbalance here is uh, across VMs, we're balanced OK. We're going to have a uh, um, VM1 versus VM3 is where the pods live. We have a health check to let us know not to go to VM2. But when you go and check out the pods below that, we can end up with this imbalance. Um, if we have a lot more pods and nodes, this isn't that really that big an issue. It's just sort of noise for the imbalance. If you have a 1,000 pods and let's say only four nodes, it doesn't really matter. If you have many, many more no nodes and pods, well, all of those pods are going to be singletons on the nodes or the VMs. And so you're not going to have an imbalance either. Between the health checks, you're always going to have a nice distribution at that first level where the network load balancer is doing the balancing to VMs. Get into problems when you have uh, situations like this, where the number of pods and the number of nodes are about the same. And then the level of, um, like Tim said, you can have some issues where uh, the, the load that your pods are dealing with are not going to be uniform. So with only local on, um, the traffic comes in, as we said earlier, the health check is not going to consider VM2. Source IP address is the client, destination is the load balancer. We can choose VM1, VM3. We're going to pick VM3 because it's more fun and interesting. Um, VM1, also fun, maybe not as much interesting. We go to VM3, source client, destination LB. And then when we get on VM3, we hit the IP tables. And remember, the IP tables could send you to anywhere that's going to have that pod. But in this case, with only local, it is only going to send you to a pod that is local to this VM. It's only going to consider pod 2 and pod 3 clearly marked in green, bright emerald green. It goes to pod 2. It easily could have gone to pod 3, but we just chose pod 2 for this session. Deeds the DNAT, reaches pod 2, and then goes back through the same natting and contracting and IP tabling path that we've discussed um, over and over again during this talk. Comes all the way back out to the node load balancer and then back to the client. And as a result, what's really important here is that your pod, the code that your developers wrote or maybe you wrote, is going to be able to see the client's IP address. You're not going to play these games of not knowing where the packet came from. You get the normal expected path that makes the most sense. Ingress. Righto. So now you all have internalized exactly how Kubernetes works. Uh, at layer four. So let's talk about layer seven, because that's way more interesting, right? There's been a couple of really good talks here this week uh, about some of the cool stuff that's happening in the layer seven space. To bring up layer seven, we have a different kind of resource in Kubernetes called an ingress. Ingress is built on top of services. So ingress. Uh, the first thing you need to do is change your service to a node port. Now, you could use. Remember I said earlier, you have cluster IP, node port, load balancer. You could use load balancer if you want an L4 also, but generally people will say, I only want the L7. So I set it up as type node port. What node port does is it tells Kubernetes, allocate me a port, the same port, on every VM in my cluster, and make sure that that port forwards onto my service. How do we forward onto that service, everybody? IP tables. So uh, it's again, literally it's the same exact code path that we followed before. So you declare this thing as a type node port, and then you introduce an ingress object. The ingress object represents a higher level concept. It's an L7 HTTP load balancer. And the cool thing about HTTP load balancers is they have an understanding of what you're actually doing at the application level. So things like a URL can map to a different service. So in this case, you can see like the world's simplest ingress has a slash customers URL. And that customer's URL is going to go to our customer's backend. And the slash products URL is going to go to our product's backend. Right? Each of these two backends are different services which are backed by a set of pods. 
through this selector mechanism that we've been seeing over and over again. So you can see here, sorry, I just highlighted that. So again, just like a service, when, the, uh, the when you do this, the controller wakes up, the controller goes out to Google Cloud, and it programs the HTTP load balancer. Again, if anybody's familiar with the Google Cloud API, the HTTP load balancer is actually about eight resources to the Google Cloud API. It's, it's sort of complicated to set up because it's so incredibly powerful. We take that for you. We do it all for you. We configure the instance groups and the back ends and the forwarding rules and the target proxies. We set it all up, and in the end, we point your IP address here. Again, you can take this IP address, you can put it in your DNS, and off to the races. So let's take a look at some traffic again. So we've got our cluster. We've got our blue and our green services, our customers and our products. Uh, these ports exist on every node. So when you create that, that service, or the ingress object, we're going to go off and create the Google Cloud load balancer. Google Cloud Load Balancer, as before, we teach it about all three VMs and uh, through, the, through the instance group mechanism. And we start taking our traffic. So our client sends something to our load balancer on the slash products path. That's the green one. We're going to take the packet through. And again, the load balancer has to choose which VM am I going to send this to. It's going to look at all the information that it has available to it. And it's going to choose a VM. In this case, it's going to choose VM3. Now, I said that we're looking at the green service, so again, I chose three to sort of be pessimal. Uh, it's going to send this traffic off to the VM. Now, take note here of the IP addresses. The source here is the load balancer, but it's not actually the IP address of the load balancer that you had. It's sort of a Google internal address that we use for all of our load balancing pool. We've published docs on these, uh, this range that we use for our load balancers. This is because our HTTP load balancer is a full proxy, right? It will terminate your TCP session. So you could do things like SSL, where you give us your certificate. We'll terminate the SSL, and we'll pass the, the packets onto the back. What it means is you lose that client IP again. But you don't actually lose it, because this is HTTP. And HTTP is so cool, because it's got things like headers. So the, the client IP address will be stuck in that X forwarded for header, which you can then use if any piece of your stack understands HTTP, you can pull that out and log that correctly. So now the packet is destined for VM3. Now, so we've changed both the source and the destination. If we go back, you see the packet here is client to load balancer. Here it's load balancer to VM. This packet is going to arrive at the green port. And this is important because we use the, the receipt at that green port as a trigger to say, hey, I know what to do with this. This is a service. And I'm going to send it, oh shoot, I'm going to send it to IP tables again. Same thing we've seen six times now. IP tables is going to choose a pod. It's going to do that NAT that we saw before. It's going to bounce out of the machine. It's going to fly over our network. We're going to receive it. No tricks this time. It's actually going to work. And it's going to come back. Now we receive it in IP tables. We do the opposite of that contract that we saw before. And we send the packet back on, and we have a happy customer. So it's even more complicated than L4. And it suffers some of the same problems. You've got this double hop still, right? So it turns out customers still want to make this decision for themselves. So we don't have to worry about losing the client's IP address. But as Jim just said, the double hop is you know, still a problem. And um, it, it adds that complexity. Everyone here can see this slide. It looks very similar to the other only local slide for a service. You can have inside of Ingress these sort of subservices based on the path or the annotations that you want. And you can specify only local again. You can configure the subservice inside the Ingress as only local. And you risk the imbalance as before, which can usually be avoided by how you choose to apportion out your nodes and pods. And you remove the second hop. So there's a lot more that we could discuss. I mean, I can just read from the slide, pod liveness probe, graceful termination, cloud health checks, firewalls, and so on and so forth. But networking is really deep. The functionality and features that people want out of Google Container Engine for networking, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, instead of talking about each one of these subtopics, you know, we really wanted to make sure that people understood the routing basics, both in, out of the um, intracluster, intercluster, egress, and ingress. And that's sort of what we were hoping to do here. I know that 
it was got a little repetitious, but it's because we build and don't waste the functionality and infrastructure that we have inside of Google Container Engine. Can I can I add? Uh, I've spent the week here working downstairs at the uh, the Meet the Experts table, and I've spoken to I know some of you. Uh, I have wanted to pull these slides out at least a dozen times over the last two days to explain concepts. Uh, and so uh, I thought it was really important that we get this information out there. Uh, I get the sense from a lot of people that this is complicated and that they don't understand it. It's an interesting talk because by the end, you get a lot of, OK, we've got it, we've got it, you've reinforced it. But then before the talk, a lot of people want to know exactly about this sort of topic. And so even inside of Google, um, when we wrote this talk, it's gotten a lot of interest. Watch this space. Uh, Google Container Engine is definitely a moving target. There's the open source components and the open source architecture, which is being worked on by you know, companies and engineers all over the world. And you know, lots of re-architecture and lots of just bug fixes and elegant and simplifications and development work is being gone, um, undergone even as we speak. Um, even Google, we're working on the Google Container Engine part as we host it and integrate it with the GCP environment. So. Next 18, it's going to look different. It will be looking maybe faster, maybe less IP tables for some of the problems that we just um, elaborated on, probably more IP tables for new functionality and new features, and um, different ways to approach these problems. So there will definitely be more ins and outs, and we hope that you come back to learn more about it next year. If you want to know more about what's going on and not wait till next year, because you know who wants to wait? Uh, here's our website for documentation. You can look at the code right now and start playing with it and examining how things work in detail. If you want to just ask questions, there's our chat and here's our Twitter. There's also a code lab downstairs, which we've been told not enough people know about, so please feel free to get your hands dirty. It's really the best way to learn about anything. And uh, there are people there who are willing to help you get started. Finally, thank you. Thank you.